For our first video in chapter seven, we'll begin to dive into the world of chemical bonding and molecular geometry, the title of chapter seven. And the good news in that regard, chemical bonding, we've talked about that a lot, right? So some of the information from this first video will seem like review and a little bit of it is new. The big takeaways from chapter seven, right? Not just learning about chemical bonding, but learning how to do Lewis structures. The Lewis structures are introduced in 7.3. We learn Lewis symbols first and then get into Lewis structures. Okay, and everything after that kind of builds on those ideas. Formal charge and resonance, looking at a Lewis structure, strengths of bonds, and then molecular geometry, referred to in the chapter title, is covered in 7.6, where we look into the structure of these things. Okay. 7.1 and 2 are bolded, not for the fact that they're the most important, but just for the fact that that's what we will be covering in this first video, beginning with ionic bonding. Okay. Keeping in mind, right, we've learned about ions before. Ions bear an electric charge. Cations are positively charged. Anions are negatively charged. Okay. Those like to come together. They're attracted to one another electrostatically. And when a cation and an anion come together in the right ratio, depending on their charge, we form an ionic compound. Okay. We also called those salts in chapter four, right? the product of a neutralization reaction, for example, a salt plus water. Okay. And ionic compounds are held together by ionic bonds. Okay. It's an electrostatic force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. So we've got a cation positive, anion negative. They're attracted to one another with an ionic bond. And that's a strong bond, and it does prevent electrons from flowing freely. Okay? They don't just kind of flow throughout the molecule. They're locked into place in those bonds. An ionic bond is a strong bond, and it prevents electrons from moving throughout the molecule. Other properties of ionic compounds we should know. They typically exhibit crystalline structures, they tend to be more rigid and brittle, right? Meaning you can easily break them. Think about like a large chunk of road salt, for example. They have very high melting and boiling points. And as I was just talking about those bonds holding electrons into place, right, ionic solids are poor conductors of electricity due to that bond strength. Okay. But we also know that we can dissolve a lot of salts in water. And then because I don't have the bonds holding the electrons in place, a solution, an aqueous solution of an ionic compound does conduct electricity. And so make sure you know those properties of ionic compounds relative to covalent compounds, which will be covered a couple slides from now. Other considerations of ionic bonds. And again, I'm hoping a lot of this seems like review. Okay. When two ions come together, right, they have different properties from where they originate. We talked about sodium and chlorine in the past. Sodium and chloride ions are vastly different from elemental sodium and chlorine. And what kind of ions we formed? We talked about that recently in chapter six. Right? We want to either lose or gain electrons where appropriate to become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas, right? Meaning it has the same electron configuration. Isoelectronic was introduced in chapter six. We're using that term again in chapter seven. And, and here we see a, plenty of examples of things that are isoelectronic. The noble gas shown in the middle, anions on the left, cations on the right, but pick any one of these rows and everything is isoelectronic with, same, with one another. They would have the same electron configuration. And why is it that we want to be in the same electron configuration as a noble gas, right? we've mentioned this before as well, those noble gases are inherently stable. They have completely filled valence shells. We talked about this a different way as well when we were talking about core electrons, which represent a noble gas configuration. They're also completely filled. And when we have those shells that are completely filled with electrons, we have an inherent stability. And that's always the case when we have the configuration of a noble gas. So how about our main group cations, okay? Main group cations. So here we're talking about group one and group two. 
for those main group elements, right? And then I guess some considerations in 13 as well. Yeah, main group elements, number of valence electrons is equal to the last digit of the group number. Okay, so group one, one valence electron. Group two, two valence electrons. Group 13, last digit is three, three valence electrons. Okay. And we lose all of those valence electrons to reach the configuration of a noble gas. And that's permissible because they have low ionization energies. Okay. That's another idea from chapter six. It's easy for them to lose those electrons and become positively charged. It's got a low energy barrier. And the key thing is we're dealing with valence electrons that we're losing, not quarks. And there are some exceptions okay, to those rules. You will not be tested on those exceptions. Okay? Just for your information, they do exist. How about transition metals and inner transition metals? Looking at our D block and our F block. Okay? We saw in chapter six, when those form cations, they're different. Okay? We're still losing valence electrons, okay? but the electrons that are lost first are the S electrons followed by the D electrons. Okay. So those things tend not to be isoelectronic with a noble gas when we have transition metal or inner transition metal cations. How about anions? Now going to the right side of the periodic table. Okay. Anions are formed by gaining electrons, which they like to do because they have high electron affinities. They're largely exothermic. It reaches a lower energy state. And they do that to fill their S and P orbitals and again become isoelectronic with a noble gas. However many electrons we gain is equal to the charge. Right? If we gained two electrons, we have a minus two charge. Then we formed our cation and our anion. How do they come together? What's an ionic compound look like? Okay. Well, we've already established the fact that they come together to form an ionic bond. And the total positive charge in the ionic compound has to be equal to the total negative charge, right? I have to have an appropriate number of cations and anions so that the charges cancel out. Sodium chloride shown here, it's one and one, right? Versus something like, I don't know, calcium nitride. Calcium has a plus two, nitride minus three. So you would need three calciums, two nitrides, for example. Right. And then I've got the note down at the bottom there that that formula, NaCl, doesn't represent the physical arrangement. It's not just individual pairs of NaCl floating around. Right. They're attracted a bunch of places all at once, right? If you pick any one of those sodiums or chlorines shown there on the right-hand side, it's attracted to several other ions. And the word for that is isotropic. Right? It's attracted to multiple ions simultaneously. And that covers a lot of the ideas from ionic compounds. A majority of this chapter seven discusses covalent compounds. So let's thought transition here and talk about covalent bonds. All right, ionic bonds have a metal and a non-metal, but if I have two non-metals coming together, now I'm not transferring electrons, I'm sharing electrons to form a covalent bond. And that's because these things have similar abilities to attract electrons. We'll see at the beginning of the next video, we refer to that as electronegativity. Okay, we'll put that on the shelf for now. Let's think about just hydrogen, H2, diatomic hydrogen. It's a covalent molecule. Each one of my hydrogens has an electron configuration of 1s1. They both just have one electron in the s orbital. Okay. The whole reason we share those electrons, right, going from the individual hydrogens here to now the shared molecule on the right-hand side, is because when the electrons are shared, they belong to both atoms simultaneously. So now both of those hydrogens feel like they have two electrons and they have fully filled the s orbital and reached that inherent stability. They're isoelectronic now with helium. By sharing electrons, they've reached a noble gas configuration. Let's look at something a little more complex now. Instead of just H2, how about HF? All right. We mentioned in chapter six, it's only the valence electrons that are involved in the formation of a covalent bond. Right? We're never going to be dealing with core electrons, just thinking about valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron. We just covered that. That's what's shown here in red. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. Right? Fluorine's in group 17. Last digit is seven. It has seven valence electrons. So why do these guys share an electron? They both contribute one electron, right? 
and then that's shown as a bond. We'll continue to see that line representing a covalent bond, represents two electrons, right? Hydrogen contributed its only electron, fluorine contributed one electron. So now they've got this pair of electrons, right, that's shared between them. And when they're shared, they've both become isoelectronic with a noble gas. Okay? Hydrogen, just like before, now has two electrons that belong to it. So it's again isoelectronic with helium. But fluorine also feels like those electrons, those two electrons in the bond belong to it. So it's now surrounded with eight electrons, filled now the 2p, and become isoelectronic with neon. If you look at a periodic table, fluorine plus an extra electron, now we're isoelectronic with neon. And that's the basics of how our covalent compounds form, right? Share electrons in the appropriate manner to have everybody happy and isoelectronic with a noble gas. So what kind of properties do we see for covalent compounds? Okay. The bonds, a covalent bond is weaker than an ionic bond okay, because the elements are neutral, right? They don't have that inherent electrostatic attraction. It's a weaker force of attraction between the two. So because they're weaker bonds, weaker intermolecular forces, these covalent compounds tend to be liquids and gases instead of solids at room temperature. Ionic compounds tend to be solid. If they are solid, there are plenty of covalent compounds that are solid at room temperature, okay, they tend to be soft and malleable, right? Instead of being able to break them, they're kind of squishy, for lack of a better word. Covalent compounds are usually insoluble in water and don't conduct electricity well in any state. Okay? Relative to ionic compounds, they also have lower melting and boiling points. <clears throat> so how are our bonds actually formed? what's going on. We see why they're formed, sharing the electrons to become isoelectronic with a noble gas. But why are these nonmetals coming together in the first place? Let's think about hydrogen for a second again. This is looking at a graph of potential energy. And if you think about those two hydrogen atoms apart from one another, okay, they exist at a certain energy. We'll call that energy zero. But notice as they come together, we actually reach a lower energy state, which was mentioned before, right? Becoming isoelectronic with helium. And when they reach an ideal distance apart from one another, right? Notice the minimum in the bond energy here. It's at the lowest possible potential energy. That's the ideal distance for those two hydrogens to be apart. And therefore, that's the bond length that I observe between two hydrogens, right? The distance low where we have the lowest potential energy. I can't put them together any closer than that. Notice we start to shoot up real quick there because then the nuclei are getting too close together. Remember the nuclei both have positively, the nuclei are both positively charged. So if we get them too close together, then they repel one another, the energy shoots up. That's what's going on over here. So this is why bonds form. We reach an area of lower potential energy. Okay? This corresponds to the bond length. This corresponds to what's known as the bond energy. Okay. So to break a chemical bond, right, we have to put energy in. It's an endothermic process. Energy has to be added. Okay, Because to break a bond, right, I have to go back up this barrier. Usually people are okay with that thought. But the other thought that we're going to end the video on, the formation of a chemical bond results in the release of energy, right? That's what's happening here. These two came together, formed a bond, it reached a lower energy state. So the formation of chemical bonds is an exothermic process. It releases energy because we got to a lower energy state. That's the answer to why things form bonds. So that wraps up our first video. In video two, we'll start to get closer to the world of Lewis symbols. To summarize from this video, make sure you're familiar with the properties of ionic compounds versus covalent compounds and know why covalent compounds form.